Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Village Voices. I'm Trudy Peterson, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and tonight we are recording this session, so be aware of that as you decide to ask questions. We do suggest that during the, the uh, talk, if you have questions, you think you're going to forget them, uh, please use the chat function and write them down. And at the end, we'll be sure and go back to those questions that have occurred to you as the discussion goes on. I want to thank uh, for this evening, um, both um, Mary Bloodworth and uh, Judy Berman of CHV who helped put this together for us. And I always thank uh, May Jean Daniels and Karen Stuck who do the publicity without which no one would know that we were doing this program. So do please mute yourself while the speaker is talking um, and we'll come back to you uh, for questions with the raised hand function, or we'll just let you wave at us and um, see if we can see your hands. And I would remind you also that next month uh, on June 6, we will have the final one of this uh, Springs Village Voices. So tonight I'm really pleased to have with us Jeffrey Cava Service, uh, who is the Vice President for Political Studies at the Niskanen Center, or Niskanen Center, I believe they pronounce it. Um, and you may know that the Niskanens lived here on Capitol Hill, and Kathy was very involved in the community. So it's a very great pleasure to have somebody from the center named after him uh, to be with us tonight. <clears throat> uh, Jeffrey Keva Service uh, has a PhD in history from Yale and has spent a lot of time writing about and thinking about the Republican Party. He had a nice book on uh, the Republican Party looking at the history from basically Eisenhower to the Tea Party. And if you're interested in that, it was published by um, Oxford in 2012. And he also writes some very interesting pieces. One of them that I particularly liked was indeed on the future of the Republican Party, which he published in November of 2020. So tonight uh, we're asking Jeff to talk with us about the paths forward for the Republican Party as he sees them from all his research. So thanks for being with us, Jeff. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Trudy. I appreciate that kind introduction. Uh, I'm curious to know how the transcription is going to work. Um, what if I were to throw a tricky two-bit word like autochthonous into the mix? <laughs> Oh, anyway, um, like I said, it's also nice to be here because uh, I guess we are all neighbors. Uh, I am living on Capitol Hill. This is, in fact, my second stint on Capitol Hill. Um, when I was actually writing my book about the Republican Party, I lived on uh, East Capitol and Fourth Street. Uh, I basically went there for its proximity to the Library of Congress, which held a lot of the materials I need. Um, for the last three years, I have been living uh, in sort of the East Kingman, uh, sorry, East Capitol Hill, Kingman Park, Lincoln Park area. Um, and for what it's worth, um, my girlfriend and I have two cats. Uh, we live on a block that used to be uh, all black and is now about half black and half white. Um, we shop at the Safeway on 14th Street. Um, I've been in the area long enough to remember that when the Safeways had different nicknames, the Social Safeway, the Secret Safeway, the Soviet Safeway, that one used to be known as the Unsafeway. Um, but of course, it's much different now. Uh, I usually go to church at St. Monica and St. James in the area, and I walk to work here at the Niskanen Center, which is in the CNN building by uh, Union Station. And um, the Niskanen Center is a center-right think tank. Uh, I don't know if you can see it because my background is blurred, uh, but if I unblurred the background, there's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt behind me. If I were to flip this around, you would actually see a picture of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, you know, we do take our moderate republicanism seriously, um, but we're also a lot less libertarian than founders were when they split off from the Cato Institute uh, about seven years ago. Um, and we have our difficulties in trying to persuade Republicans uh, in Congress to come around to what we regard as sensible mainstream positions on issues like <laughs> climate change uh, and immigration and the rest. I have the privilege of being a generalist, which is great. Uh, it means I get to relive a lot of my academic years when I was just making broad pronouncements on the Republican <laughs> Party 
and he's pretty <laughs> got us here. Let me um, just set the table here. I don't want to actually give a big uh, uh, sort of prepared speech. If you were expecting a prepared speech, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I think they come across as inauthentic in the age of Trump. Uh, and I think uh, social media, in addition to its many impacts in other ways, has also made uh, prepared speeches feel weird. Um, but the basic things I wanted to say is that we are obviously in a political situation in the midterm year. Uh, most likely the Democrats are going to lose big this year. Uh, it's probably going to be a repeat of the 2010 pattern. Um, and in most ways, this is just a, a sort of historical phenomenon. Uh, since World War II, the average president has lost uh, 26 seats uh, from his own party in his first term. Uh, the Republicans only need five seats in the House to retake control of that body. Uh, the Senate is more of a toss up for reasons that we can discuss, but again, the odds are looking pretty good there too. This is largely a function of President Biden's popularity or lack thereof. The last time I checked, he was at 50% disapprove, 44% approve, which is actually a bit of an improvement from what it was a few weeks ago, but obviously uh, not a place where a president or his party wants to be as you head into midterms of this sort. Um, and of course, Biden's drop in popularity uh, and is going underwater can be traced directly to uh, mid-August of last year and the chaotic American withdrawal from Afghanistan, which continues to have a big impact, I think, uh, on his popularity. But in addition to that, it's gonna be a difficult cycle for Democrats because they, of course, are coping with inflation, uh, rising levels of violent crime, the chaotic situation at the Southern border, intra-party divisions and perceived progressive overreach on what I believe to be unpopular issues, including race and sexuality. Uh, I suppose it's always wise to announce one's uh, bona fides and backgrounds here. I am a registered Republican, uh, which is pretty rare in Washington, DC, but I also work at the Niskanen Center, which is known as one of the intellectual centers of the Never Trump movement. So take that as you will. Uh, most of the polls that have been taken show Republican voters to be considerably more motivated than Democrats as the midterms approach, although that may change if Roe and Casey are in fact overturned by the Supreme Court. So that's kind of like a sort of usual politics background, but then we add the unusual politics, which is basically everything connected with Donald Trump. Uh, why are Republican voters so motivated to get to the polls this year? Well, it's because uh, an overwhelming majority of them believe that the 2020 election was stolen by Democrats, although they have no more basis of proof for this than Donald Trump himself does, and they would be more or less incapable of proving this in a court of law. Nonetheless, this is a deeply held opinion upon Republicans, um, and they see 2022 uh, as a chance to get revenge. Um, I'm always asked by other pundits when the Republican Party base is going to abandon Trump or turn on him. And I think the answer is probably never uh, because they've stuck by him at every turn, whether it be uh, his defeat in the presidential election, his lying about it having been stolen and even his incitement of the January 6th assault on the US Capitol, which of course a lot of you will remember so well because it just took place a few blocks from us. Um, Trump. I hardly need tell you is still by far the most popular figure in the Republican Party. Um, his influence was shown most recently uh, when he endorsed J.D. Vance in the Ohio Republican senatorial primary. Uh, J.D. Vance, of course, is well known as the author of Hillbilly Elegy, but at the time before Trump advanced him, uh, endorsed him in mid-April, he was in fourth place. Uh, he almost immediately went to uh, the top of the pack, and then he won a pretty convincing victory in that primary. And it was really you know, due to a number of factors. One could include Peter Thiel's uh, financial undergirding, uh, Tucker Carlson's uh, relentless promotion of J.D. Vance. But really a lot of it was Trump's influence with the base. Uh, one Ohio voter told a New York Times reporter, if Trump supports Vance, then we know he will be good. Um, and Trump's unparalleled dominance of his party, I think I have to tell you was pretty weird. It's not like Gerald Ford uh, or Ronald Reagan even, were trying to exert this kind of influence over their party when they were out of office. Um, Trump has made hundreds of endorsements up and down the ticket, many of them of incumbents, but some also in primary races, uh, in races ranging from congressional and senatorial candidates to secretaries of state and other offices that typically fly well below the radar of most voters. Um, and so for example, in Pennsylvania, uh, you will have known 
Trump had the leading Republican senatorial candidates sort of audition for his endorsement, uh, as if this were an episode of uh, The Apprentice, his reality TV show. And so he brought in TV doctor Mehmet Oz and hedge fund David McCormick. Um, they came to Mar-a-Lago. They kind of supplicated themselves before Trump. They told him and all the world about how they have undying loyalty to all things Trumpian. Uh, and in the end, Trump gave the nod to Dr. Oz. Now, this doesn't mean that Oz is going to win. In fact, McCormick is actually leading in the polls right now. And there are some candidates, for example, uh, like David Perdue, who is challenging uh, Brian Kemp in Georgia in the gubernatorial primary. Uh, and probably that's going to be a Kemp victory. But this won't be a repudiation of Trump, because even Kemp is basically holding to what he sees to be uh, as the Trumpian attitude and positions of the party. Uh, and even the candidates who win who didn't get Trump's endorsement are still running as Trumpists on some basic level. There simply is no real competing poll of power in the Republican Party um, other than the completely uh, unarticulated uh, antipathies of Mitch McConnell and the relatively insignificant uh, opposition of figures like, let's say, Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland. Uh, but basically, the positions that Trump sets down are his positions. Obviously, this is a party that did not even put out a policy platform in 2020. So to call Trump positions, maybe that'd be going a bit too far. Um, really, what Trump stands for is not any particular ideology. He just wants loyalty toward himself. Um, but his positions essentially flow out of a sense that he and to some extent his followers are being screwed, whether that's being screwed by a sort of dominant liberal elite that controls all of the centers of culture, or whether it's being screwed by foreigners uh, like China who are screwing us in trade, or whether it's NATO who are uh, deadbeats who won't pay up their share of, of uh, the, the, the NATO alliance. This is basically the kind of resentment that Trump is playing upon. Um, so anyway, all of the sort of talk about there being a civil war in the Republican party, depending on the outcomes of the primaries, I think is nonsense because there really isn't any kind of significant faction that could rise to the level of a civil war. Um, the only way that I think Trump's dominance could be shaken over the Republican party is if his preferred candidates go too far in seeking his approval. Um, some of you may remember the now obscure figure, uh, Todd Akin, who was running for the Missouri Senate in 2012 against the Democratic incumbent, Claire McCaskill. Um, and this was basically a shoe in victory until Todd Akin made the extremely ill-advised remark that uh, the victims of rape rarely get pregnant because the body ha has ways of shutting down the outcome of quote unquote legitimate rape. Um, this is something that was sort uh -huh. of uncontroversial within the sort of evangelical circles that Todd Akin traveled in, but struck mainstream voters very much the wrong way. Um, and Trumpianism entails extremism as much as anything else, as much as any particular political position. That can be extremism of the hard right variety, uh, which explains why the Trump appointees just uh, on the Supreme Court basically seem to have given their assent toward overturning 50 years of settled precedent uh, on abortion rights uh, as codified in Roe versus Wade and also uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, but it's also uh, Trumpism entails a kind of anti-establishment, uh, almost nihilistic opposition to governing and settled norms. Um, and so it's no accident really that Trump's closest allies in Congress uh, have been the members of the House Freedom Caucus, which is not necessarily all that much more conservative than other groupings uh, in the Republican Congress, such as the Republican Study Committee, but it is the most committed to opposing compromise or even deal making with the Democrats. It's the most opposed to basically uh, standard governing or governance, if you want to put it that way, uh, of the Republican Party. Um, and this, like I said, could result in too much chaos, too many unpopular uh, candidates for uh, the Republican Party to win a majority in the Senate because they lose winnable elections. So J.D. Vance, for one, in positioning himself as the most Trumpy figure in the race, uh, called for Trump to fire every single civil servant in government and replace them with our people if he wins a second term. Um, and he said that Trump should just do this regardless of what the law says. He should respond as Andrew Jackson allegedly said to a pronouncement by the Supreme Court Justice, uh, the Supreme Court justice has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Um, and of course, there's a, a lot of loose talk about coups and Democrats not being a legitimate political party, which therefore in their eyes legitimizes the events of January 6th and would legitimize an attempt 
to do uh, similar things in 2024. And of course, it's very possible that if Trump succeeds in putting his people into office uh, in advance of 2024, that you won't get the people like uh, Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State, who resisted Trump's efforts to find him a few thousand votes and give him uh, the electoral votes in that state. Um, we shall see. So in terms of how we got here, um, you know, that's a big subject. Um, and there are many interpretations for where Trump comes from, why people like Trump, why they go so far uh, in frankly un-American directions, uh, why he's so willing to break norms and why this doesn't bother uh, so many of his supporters. Um, a couple theories. One theory is that we're kind of basically going back to the Republican Party of the 1920s. Um, here's kind of a fun trivia question for you. When was the last time that a Republican presidential candidate won a majority of the popular vote without a Nixon or a Bush on the ticket? It's sort of a trick question. The answer is 1928. It was Herbert Hoover. That was the last time. Um, the party of the 1920s did resemble uh, Donald Trump's in a lot of ways. Uh, in other words, the candidates, uh, Harding, Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover uh, were against immigration. Uh, they basically campaigned on a, on a program of prosperity uh, along with low taxes. Uh, they basically uh, were for shielding American manufacture from foreign competition. Um, they uh, also did not want America to become entangled in any kind of overseas situations. They were functionally isolationist. Um, and uh, like I said, this is actually pretty similar in some ways to the Trumpian political party, except that um, Coolidge and the like were actually a very confident and optimistic uh, political grouping. Uh, they represented and defended the main institutions of American life. They weren't driven by the kinds of resentments that you see uh, in Trump's party. That Republican party of the 1920s, that grouping of ideology uh, was basically delegitimized by the 20th century uh, and the coming first of the depression and then uh, of World War II. Um, it resurfaced in uh, the McCarthyist movement of the early 1950s, but that too was something that most Americans came to feel was not uh, something that was right for American politics or needed to be repeated. So then you get into interpretation, which is basically my book, Rule and Ruin, um, which is that the Republican Party used to be a more factional party. It was not united by ideology. Uh, conservatives, as we think of them now, were in fact the minority faction in the party for most of the 20th century. Um, but the moderates whom you know, we, I think of in terms of people like Teddy Roosevelt, in terms of Dwight Eisenhower, they were ultimately outplayed by the conservatives for any number of reasons that, like I said, we could get into. And eventually conservatives took over the party and against the counsel of people like Ronald Reagan, um, there became ideological litmus tests that determined who was a real Republican and who was a Republican in name only. And there was a sort of forcing out of people who disagreed with this litmus test, which facilitated the Republican Party and the Democratic Party exchanging their respective bases. So the Republican Party historically was the country club party, the party of business, the party of the college educated. The Democrats were the party of the working class. Um, now that is more nearly opposite. Um, in other words, the Republican Party represent a, a majority of Republicans or people without college degrees. Um, and if you have a college degree, you are much more likely and increasingly likely to vote Democrat. And interestingly, this is also scrambling a lot of the Democrats' calculations about uh, how the Obama coalition of the ascendant would take them into majorities in the future. Because what we see right now is that uh, Hispanics uh, predominantly vote Republican on a generic ballot um, and seem likely to become a loyal Republican constituency as unlikely as this seems with someone like Donald Trump uh, with his frankly anti-Hispanic remarks uh, atop the ticket. But the reality is that most Hispanics are members of the working class. They are not college educated in a majority. They see their interests as being with the party of the working class and not with the Democrats as a party of the college educated professional classes. Um, there's another explanation, which I think is pretty convincing, which is that the conservative era, we'll think of Reaganite conservatism, came to an end with the twin failures of 2001 and 2008. That is to say, 
Uh, the debacle in first Iraq and then Afghanistan really deprived uh, neoconservatism and George W. Bush conservatism of a lot of its legitimacy. And then the failures of the financial crisis also uh, persuaded a lot of the increasingly working class voters uh, of the Republican Party that big business and finance were their enemies. And therefore the kind of libertarianism that had played the dominant role in conservatism up to that time has become increasingly discredited. And what you hear about now is national conservatism, which also goes along with uh, post-liberalism. Uh, in other words, there's actually an increasing belief that uh, belief in free elections, democracy, freedom of speech, and the rest of this uh, have to go before real Americanism. Um, and then also uh, there's the influence of social media and uh, what might be called the entertainment wing of the party. And this has consistently dethroned uh, would-be gatekeepers from both the conservative movement and the Republican Party at every turn. Um, and essentially the incentives right now are entirely towards setting your hair on fire with extreme positions. And this will play well both with small bill donors and also with Fox News and the even more extreme OANN. Uh, and there's no way really to rein in uh, kind of entrepreneurs like Marjorie Taylor Greene, let's say, who increasingly is the face of the Republican Party, which means there's no way for the party as a whole to resist this turn toward Trumpian populism. Let me stop right there. Uh, I feel like this is kind of a bit of a lot to lay on you, and I am sure that uh, we will sort of pick apart different elements of what I've been talking about in the course of the questions you raise. So have at me, neighbors. <laughs> Well, yes, you're right. That's a lot to talk about. Let me um, just start out by asking you about Joe McCarthy, because that's certainly something I remember from my childhood was the Army McCarthy uh, denouement, finally. Um, and that was very right wing, and yet it didn't quite take over the party. And, and of course, you had Eisenhower in the White House, so that made some big difference, of course. But uh, how did the party resist then and was then unable to do so when Trump comes along? So um, the McCarthy movement is really um, the repressed isolationist movement coming back to the fore uh, after World War II. Um, again, it's important to remember how dominant isolationism was in American life prior to America's entrance uh, into World War II. Uh, if it had been left up to a majority vote, the United States never would have gone in until we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Uh, but the isolationist movement had also discredited itself um, with particularly Charles Lindbergh's uh, infamous Des Moines, Iowa speech uh, for the America First Committee, where he said that the only people, the only factions opposing Americans staying out of the war were in Jews, essentially, as well as bankers and Wall Street cosmopolitans. Um, and it was this kind of nativist conservatism that was severely discredited as well by its associations with Nazism for obvious reasons. And the belief on the part of most Americans that never again should be our ruling creed. That's why, although America had resisted entrance into the League of Nations, most Americans enthusiastically supported our entrance into the United Nations. But what you actually saw was that there was no way to actually overtly oppose that. If there had been enough momentum behind a resurgence of isolationism, then the Republican Party presidential nominee in 1952 would not have been Dwight Eisenhower. It would have been Ohio Senator Robert Taft, who continued to be the standard bearer for that kind of pre-war isolationism. Um, but since that was not something that would actually fly with the majority of the American people, McCarthyism was kind of a sideways attempt to get back to that form of isolationism. And it was saying that essentially America had been betrayed. Uh, by its elites, betrayed from within, not so much betrayed by foreign spies, although that was always part of it, but that America needed to look inward and purge itself of these un-Americans who were imposing their views on the majority of the real people. Um, it's true, Eisenhower ultimately was able to resist that, but you could also say that McCarthy essentially put himself into receivership by simply going too far. Um, it's not like Eisenhower overtly stopped him. Eisenhower did cut him off from the supply of secret information he had been receiving from J. Edgar Hoover uh, and the FBI. Hoover, another Capitol Hill resident, uh, although not one of the ones who's with us among the living. Um, and that really cut off whatever kind of basis uh, McCarthy had for making his actual charges. Um, but more generally, uh, McCarthy discredited himself in this new medium of television um, 
by really attacking uh, helpless people uh, who really uh, were the basis why you eventually had the Joseph Welch say, have you no decency, sir, at long last. Um, and from there, uh, McCarthy also succumbed to his alcoholism uh, and died shortly after he was, well, not only a few years after he was censured by the Senate. Um, but, you know, McCarthyism lived on in many of the personnel of this emerging conservative movement. Um, Human Events, which was the first conservative magazine, was founded by former America Firsters who had become a staunch stalwarts of McCarthyism. Uh, William F. Buckley Jr. was both an America Firster and then a McCarthy ally. He, together with his brother-in-law, Brent Bozell, co-wrote a defense of McCarthyism called McCarthy and His Enemies. And Bozell went on to become a speechwriter for McCarthy. And that kind of resentment of elites, uh, East Coast cosmopolitans, Wall Street bankers, non-real Americans, that continued to be a dominant theme, I would say, of conservatism and has continued to the present day. QAnon, in its own way, um, is a sort of rehash of some of these themes which have been with us since McCarthy. Um, but Republican leaders, conservative leaders have typically tried to be gatekeepers of this kind of paranoia and conspiracy theory because they know that it doesn't play well with the mainstream of the American people. Um, and Bill Buckley had a very colorful quote uh, in one of his letters to a supporter as to why he eventually turned against the John Birch Society, which in some ways was a kind of... Uh, heir to McCarthyism and forerunner of QAnon. He said, what we really need to do as Republicans is win the votes of the wishy-washy conservatives. And if they see us becoming pathological and ridiculous by associating with the Birchers, they will pass by crackpot alley and go all the way over to the other side to the Democrats. So essentially there's been this movement within both conservatism and Republicanism to make it acceptable to respectable opinion. But every once in a while, a demagogue will surface and his allure will be powerful and it will be very hard to gatekeep him. And that's the situation that we've seen with the last uh, six years of Donald Trump. Judy, you've got your hand up. I do. I, kind of, I have two questions I'd like to ask. Um, and you can, you can choose to, well, however you want to respond to these. Um, one is about how people like you um, who are, you know, clearly thoughtful and I think, you know, critical of, of what you're seeing, um, like how do, how does it, what is the, what is the pull to stay aligned with the Republican party as it gets increasingly represented by these kind of, ex, by these extremist sort of views? Um, you know, where is, where is the line, you know, where do you, where or when do, um, you know, longtime Republicans say enough? Um, and, um, you know, or, or decide that fighting from within is, is not going to be effective. Um, and the other question is a completely different question, which is about sort of white supremacist terrorism and how sort of like how terrorism has, what, what the role of terrorism is in shaping the Republican party, um, you know, and how, um, you know, the resistance to thinking about sort of homegrown terrorism versus foreign terrorism and, and things. And, and where do you see that going, that, that sort of part of the movement, which is much more sort of, I guess, more anarchist probably, but still sort of has some of the, um, you know, some of the same qualities that we're seeing in the extremes of the Republican party. Oh, well, this had been such a happy occasion prior to this <laughs> question. Um, you know, uh, I run a discussion group off the record. And back in 2017, when I started it, it was almost 100% Republicans, um, mostly centrist, some traditional Republicans, but all of them shocked and horrified by Donald Trump and what he stood for uh, and what he was bringing into the Republican Party. Now, I would say only a third of that group at most are still Republicans. Um, another third are independents, many of whom place a lot of stock in the Renew America movement, which is sort of positioning itself as a third party independent party. And then about a third have gone over to the Democrats uh, and think that the way to save the Republic is to support the moderate wing of the Democratic Party. 
Um, and, you know, in my role as kind of the uh, um, ringmaster uh, of these discussions, I don't adhere strongly to any of these positions. Um, I am still a Republican because I think the long span of American history shows that um, third parties don't work. Uh, the famous quote by the historian uh, Richard Hofstetter was that third parties at best are like bees. They sting and then they die. That is to say, they seize upon an issue that's not being addressed by the other two parties. They make one of the two parties take over that position and then they fade away. And for example, you saw that, I think most vividly, not here, but um, in Britain with uh, the Brexit issue. Where is the UKIP party? Gone. Uh, because essentially the Tory party took over that Brexit issue and assimilated it. Um, and, you know, America only has two parties, in my view. And if there are only two parties, then this means that the dialectic ultimately is that Americans will get tired of the incumbent party. They will become particularly tired of the incumbent party if the incumbent party controls um, both the Congress and the presidency, as is the case right now. And then they will turn to the other party regardless of what that other party stands for. Um, and normally this is not a big problem. Right now it's actually a big problem uh, because what that other party and the Republicans under Donald Trump might stand for is making sure that the 2024 election is our last free and fair election. Um, and I think, you know, there's uh, a lot of difficulty in addressing the rank and file Republicans, even of the relatively traditional variety, if they perceive that you are coming at them from a position of contempt. Um, and, you know, one of the great gaffes of modern American political history has been Hillary Clinton's comment that half of Donald Trump supporters were deplorables. Um, you know, granted, they were waiting for something like that. Um, but, you know, I think there is considerable reality to the fact that, you know, on top of the different levels of political identity we have, which have all become stacked on each other and magnified, um, the reality is that the Democratic Party are the elite or have a better claim to being the party of the elite than the Republican Party, which increasingly is a working class party. And the Democratic Party is an educated party. Um, and the Republican Party is not. And the Republican Party is a predominantly rural party from small towns and the parts of the United States economy that have mostly suffered from globalization and demanufacturing and deindustrialization and most of the trends of the past several decades, which in fact reward the highly educated workers. Um, and you know, this is something that I think is not sufficiently taken in mind, even by well-intentioned Democrats, uh, because it's simply off of their radar screens. You know, we tend to live in our bubbles. And I cannot tell you the last time that I was talking with a Democrat, which I do quite frequently, and he or she unbidden brought up the opioid epidemic. Uh, because it's not something that we think about. Um, and yet this killed off 100,000 Americans last year. Uh, an unbelievable carnage. And yet it sort of passes by without notice because it's happening to other people. Um, so anyway, I think, you know, that there's still room to be a Republican and to speak uh, of the old Republican heritage, which was a good and worthwhile heritage and one that can't be lost. Um, and, you know, I think it's possible that although the Democrats are right now the party of liberalism uh, in most dimensions, that in fact, it, there could be the Republican Party that emerges as the more liberal party in economic terms, um, because we've had these shifts before. The Democratic Party, after all, used to be the party of Jim Crow and the South. The Republican Party, by contrast, is the party that dropped you strong government in the form of winning the Civil War, in the terms of freeing the slaves, in terms of uh, creating the transcontinental railroad, establishing the land grant colleges and universities. You could go on down the list. Um, the biggest public works project in American history was instituted by Dwight Eisenhower in the form of the Federal Highway Project. So, you know, when neither party really has a fixed identity um, in that sense, and neither party is going to maintain a durable majority for the foreseeable future, I think it's important that both parties be sane governing parties. And if the Republican Party seizes power under Donald Trump and goes the direction that I think it will go. If it's left unfettered, then God help us all. Um, and you know, the only way that serious Trumpets are gonna be stopped is at the level of primary elections. These low turnout elections in which the vast majority of the American population does not participate 
which leaves them open to domination by a committed minority, which tends to be an extreme minority. And the candidates pander to that, knowing that they don't actually have to care what the bulk of their constituents feel on any particular issues. All they have to do is answer to that increasingly radical base. So that's my long-winded answer for I'm still a registered Republican. Um, but you know, your other question is sort of related, right? Um, you know, terrorism is a bit of a tricky question because, you know, was the attack on the Capitol an act of terrorism? I would say so, um, but you can get other people sort of with other definitions. What's more concerning, I think, is the increasing traction that white nationalist attitudes are having um, on increasing the segments of the population and actually increasingly large segments of the youth. Um, and there's no way that polls can accurately surface this because so much of it is expressed only online. Um, but, you know, terrorism can be expressed in, for example, death threats against election officials um, who are betraying their country and their race. That's sort of, you know, a sort of dual equation one often sees. And, you know, we have done a terrible job in terms of trying to stop these kind of overt threats. The FBI is virtually useless when it comes to these things. This will be seen as one of their major failings, I think, if things really come apart. Um, but, you know, again, the reality is that there seems to be no consequence for adopting these kind of attitudes racially as well as um, in terms of violence and the expression of extreme opinions, whether it's actually uh, online anonymously or even increasingly in person and face to face. Um, and I think that equation has to be reversed. There actually has to be a stand for civility on both parties, but this also means that both parties have to control their illiberal tendencies. And, you know, we could take up the whole time with my saying, you know, what I see as the illiberal tendencies on the left, um, but certainly there are plenty of illiberal tendencies on the right as well. I'm not saying that I have the answers for the Democrats, but I think that both parties knew a better, need to do a better job, again, of setting limits uh, and returning to American norms where possible. Uh, I do not believe the American norm is white supremacy. I believe the American norm is that we are a country founded in liberal ideals of equality of opportunity. And we have seen increasing progress through our history in both parties to support that trend. Uh, and it pains me to feel that we're going backwards now. Okay, other questions, hands? Um, Do I see anyone? I'm looking to Trudy. I don't Judy, see Judy I, no, I'm, just, I'm looking to. I don't see any other. I don't see any hands. Or did? Oh, Judy I see Judy Canning. Canning. Yeah. Where's the oh, hand? You're on, on mute, Judy. Judy, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> This is a very simplistic question. How do sane Republicans take back the Republican Party? <laughs> Literally, that building over on first and C. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a tough question. That's the, yeah, the, the sixty-four thousand dollar question to use an old uh, analogy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Republican Party has an interest in not going to extremes. Um, <laughs> The problem with American life generally, uh, sort of taking it from the overarching area, is that we, in many ways, are a declining country, yeah. declining relative to the rest of the world, um, but we're also declining relative to our own past performance, um, our own internal unity, our own ability to govern ourselves effectively. Um, and we are doing this at a time when other uh, nations in the world uh, are increasingly presenting challenges to That's the liberal the global order that we have led since 1945. Um, and part of the reason, again, looking at a very top level explanation as to why we are in this increasing political dysfunction is that neither party has been able to establish a durable popular majority. And that's very much out of keeping with the wider patterns of American political life. Usually it's one party that is the dominant party for decades on end. Um, and certainly that was the case with the Republican party um, really after the civil war uh, with only the sort of brief interruptions of Glover Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson um, up to the great depression in the 1930s. Then it was the Democratic Party turn under Franklin Roosevelt and New Deal liberalism and his coalition, 
which really endured um, up through and beyond the Reagan era. Um, and then it was essentially kind of Reaganite conservatism that established to some extent a majority, but really what you've seen for the last several decades is neither party dominating Congress or the presidency for a sustained period of time and control sort of switching back and forth. And this means that there really isn't any incentive to compromise on the part of the out party, because they're pretty sure that if it's just a the thermostatic reaction, where eventually the other, the American people will tire of the other party and you'll get back control, why should you need to modulate or moderate your positions? Um, eventually you'll get power back and you'll be able to do, you hope, exactly what you want. And increasingly in this polarized age, what each party wants is to eradicate the other party and all of its works. But they can't do that, again, for the same thermostatic dynamic that neither party has established complete dominance. I happen to feel, and we can debate this, that the majority of Americans are in fact moderate. They're not extremists. If you actually look at the polls, the number of deeply committed progressives is about 10%. The number of deeply committed um, conservatives, extreme conservatives is about 15%. Those are not majorities of the public. So on my uh, podcast, The Vital Center, making a quick plug, I, I'm the worst self-promoter in the world, but I feel like I ought to do that. I get into a lot of these discussions in hour-long conversations with interesting people. In the intro, I say that um, you know we're talking about the muddled moderate majority of the American people, and I do believe that's the case. But neither party has been able to establish a durable hold on that muddled moderate majority because neither party really has played toward the middle classes and the center. Um, and if the Republican Party were to do that, I can easily paint you a picture about how they could become the dominant party, particularly given that two thirds of the people in this country do not have college degrees. Um, and a sane Republican Party, even one influenced by Trumpian populism, could put together a kind of program that would have America be a strong party in the world, uh, sound economics, the kind of economy running hot, bringing prosperity even to the working classes, as we saw in at least three years of Trump's presidency. Um, you would have probably an America that's standing up more to China than Joe Biden is perceived as doing. Um, and you would have an America that um, spoke to the working class's needs with um, the kind of social welfare programs that Democrats in the interest of balancing budgets may someday cut if these tendencies keep going forward. And you would have a Republican party that, uh, for example, was a, a strong supporter of apprenticeship programs um, and other programs to benefit the working class. But that's not what we have. What instead we have is a Republican party intent on waging culture war because it knows that it can get back majorities by doing that. Um, and you know, again, we could talk about the Democrats, how they, I think, could get a lot more of what they wanted by pitching themselves more toward the middle class than they are doing, but that would be a longer conversation. And I see someone else has their hand up. Yeah, Karen Brannon's got a hand up. I don't see my hand. No, it's Ann Grace that has a hand up. Okay, let's go to Ann then. Go. Um, I, I guess my concern is that I'm listening to what you're saying, and I feel like I'm going to move to Spain or somewhere. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I've always felt in this country that we had this swing back and forth. And right now, it doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be much of a swing. I've always thought at some point it was going to get back to the center. I just don't see that happening now. Is it that depressing? I don't, I feel very uncomfortable with where we are right now. You know, I think um, that most Americans were pretty comfortable with divided government in the past because the assumption was that both parties were basically responsible um, and that though the shading would be one way if the Democrats were in power and another way if the Republicans were in power, that essentially both parties shared the same ends of peace and prosperity for the American people, even though they might differ on the means of getting there. Uh, but I don't think that's where we are right now. Um, I think the Republicans genuinely see Democrats as un-Americans um, who don't deserve to be in power. And I think Democrats increasingly view Republicans that way as well. Um, and the parties are, I believe, further apart 
Now, yes, there has been what political scientists call asymmetric polarization. The Republican Party certainly went first and further in the direction of its extremes. But I think it's also kind of hard to deny that the Democrats have gone towards some cultural positions that are at the very least a lot different uh, and further out than they were a few years ago. And that this is taken as kind of just normal when it wouldn't have been seemed normal by past standards. And I think, you know, there's a lot of ability in the American people to deal with change. It's extreme by many. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like maybe we're losing that capacity as we become more polarized. Um, and I feel like the only way back, again, is for both parties to recommit to the liberal ideals that form the basis of American liberalism and American conservatism. Um, and these are free speech, civil liberties, civil rights, free elections, uh, accepting that uh, when you lose an election, the other party governs and you peacefully allow that transition of power to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think we have to just, again, stand for that because if we don't, ultimately this will just accelerate our national decline. Jeff, we've got a question in the chat and it's who do you hope will be the Republican nominee in 2024? And would you like to be the, and who would you like to be the nominee? I would not like to be the nominee myself. Thank you very much. I have a difficult <laughs> no, who would you life. like to be the nominee? I have a difficult enough life without actually getting involved uh, in actually political campaigning myself. Um, you know, at this point, I would like anyone but Donald Trump to be the nominee. Um, I think he is a uniquely dangerous figure. Um, and that is because I think he is actually a uniquely talented and gifted figure in his own demagogic way. I don't think we've actually seen somebody who has his control over uh, the media environment, the informational environment since the 1930s. Um, most of the other likely candidates to be the nominee, if it's not Donald Trump, will be lesser forms of Donald Trump. Um, at this point, again, if you were sort of a, a, a in the horse race business, you would say that the likeliest mini me Trump would be Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, um, who certainly has his own flaws, and he has some that Trump doesn't have. Um, I'm a Florida native. So I've been actually very distressed to see Florida's turn toward this kind of Trumpism extremism on an issue that Trump himself didn't care that much about, which is um, the equality of gay and lesbian Americans. You know, Trump, we tend to forget uh, actually, maybe because he came from New York, maybe because he actually did have gay and lesbian acquaintances never much cared to sort of demagogue on those issues. He accepted gay marriage as settled fact. He held up a rainbow flag um, on a number of rallies. He allowed Peter Thiel to address the Republican convention the first time any openly gay man had done so. So people like um, Ron DeSantis are innovating in a way that actually goes beyond Trump on certain axes of extremism. But I find it hard to believe that Trump, that uh, DeSantis or anyone else would have the talent uh, or the sort of malignant uh, intentions that would be needed to overthrow democracy in a way that I can easily see Donald Trump doing uh, come the next presidential election. Who would I like to be the presidential nominee? I would love for the nominee to be someone like Larry Hogan, uh, someone like Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, someone like Phil Scott up in Vermont. These are actually the three most popular political figures in the United States right now. So it's not unreasonable that the Republican Party would turn to uh, such a politically popular uh, and potent person. But I think that's almost impossible given the primary structure that we have, given the nature uh, essentially of the Republican Party as it stands today. So I think I will just have to settle for it being someone other than Trump. Jeff, we have gone uh, almost uh, 50 minutes and have not mentioned the war in Ukraine. How do you see that playing into the election this year and in 2024? So, um, you know, the war in Ukraine is personally distressing uh, to me, in addition to distressing, I think, everyone who sees those images, those terrible images on television. Um, my American girlfriend for 25 years had lived in Moscow. Um, and, you know, I had been to Moscow my first time in 1987. Uh, I have enormous respect for the Russian people and the Russian culture, which is truly one of the world's great cultures. We had told ourselves this narrative of for 30 years that Russia was becoming increasingly integrated into um, the West and the developed world. And it was in many ways, if you had been plopped down in Moscow 
uh, six months ago, you wouldn't really have been able to tell it apart from a typical Western European city other than the Cyrillic lettering on everything. But of course, you know, Vladimir Putin is a dictator, uh, an increasingly erratic one, and we should have seen this risk coming. Uh, at this point, I feel like Joe Biden, the best thing he has done has been his positions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. I think the United States has come late, perhaps, to the level of assistance that it ought to be showing toward Ukraine, but it is getting there and things look bad for the Russian military effort. They've had to embarrassingly retreat from Kiev, especially, but I think we're entering in a phase where Russia may simply bring the force of its um, uh, military numbers uh, and equipment to bear in simply pulverizing Ukrainian cities, as we have seen, for example, with their entrance into Berlin uh, in 1945. In terms of how it's playing out in politics, it's hard to say. Um, Biden's had maybe a little bit of a sort of rally around the flag boost, but not much. Um, and most Republicans, I would say, are kind of rediscovering a certain amount of their Reagan Thatcherite feelings. Um, I was in Brussels a month and a half ago for the National Conservatism Conference. Um, and although these are nationalists of all countries uh, in Europe and America, these are people who, generally speaking, had taken a more isolationist position. Uh, there also was a similar conference here in DC called the Up From Chaos position, where you had people sort of still flying the isolationist flag. But the reality is that that's a bad look right now, when there's an obvious aggressor and an obvious villain in this case, and Vladimir Zelensky has won the world's uh, respect by being in effect on another Churchill. And you've seen people who were inclining toward that Trumpian isolationist anti-NATO position like J.D. Vance reverse pretty quickly. Um, and so although Vance a month and change ago said that he didn't care one way or another uh, what happened to the Ukrainians, he belatedly realized there's 90,000 voters in Ohio of Ukrainian descent and now he's kind of on board. Uh, whether this will actually cost him in the election, whether it'll cost the Republican Party, I don't know. Uh, whether this would actually change Donald Trump's stated opinion that he would withdraw uh, the United States from NATO in a second term, again, it sort of remains to be seen. I would say at this point, it doesn't look like uh, it's having a huge impact on politics, but as with the potential overturning of Roe versus Wade, this is something where it may simply be too soon to tell. Okay, Judy Berman's got another. No, nope. no I see we, we Reno. Oh, okay. I have my question. I, I had a, a, a comment in the chat, but it's sort of a little bit facetious. In the way. <laughs> Far left, below Judy Berman. He's had his hand up forever. Um, Lee Reno, did you have your hand up? Yes. But you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I've, hmm? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I, I've listened and I listened to your talk about why you're a Republican, but I, I, I don't get it. Um, you have spoken nothing about any of the issues that face this country. Uh, or that the Republican Party is facing these issues. And what the Republican Party has done is stopped any, any kind of solution to some of these most serious issues that we face. And how one can remain a Republican in that kind of condition is beyond me. So I'd ask you again, why are you a Republican? So I feel I have addressed issues, um, but you know the reality is that everything the Democrats want to accomplish, they have to accomplish with some degree of Republican cooperation. Um, and to say that the Republican party- why is that? A durate opponent of everything. The Democrats simply don't have the numbers. It's a mere matter of math. Democrats do not have the 60 votes in the Senate that they need to pass their preferred legislation. Which is unfortunate that there's, right. it requires 60 votes, isn't it? This is the reality that America has lived with for the last several centuries. Um, and the reality also is that the Republican Party has, in fact, cooperated with Democrats on some fairly high profile legislation. One certainly thinks of the um, pandemic recovery bills, but also the infrastructure bill, which actually secured the agreement of 19 Republicans in the Senate. 
Um, and so the idea that nothing can get done these days because Republicans will oppose everything is number one, false. And number two, if wow. true, would consign the Democrats to a position of complete legislative impotence. Um, my colleague, Matt Iglesias, has written about uh, the so-called secret Congress. This is actually what happens on a day-to-day -day basis where Congress negotiates issues behind closed doors without media attention. Because once the media puts a spotlight on any issue, it becomes toxic and everyone has to retreat to their respective partisan corners. But the reality is that, you know, the parties actually do make decent secret progress in terms of funding bills, in terms of surface transportation bills, even in terms of climate change issues, so long as they don't actually reach the level of, let's say, Tucker Carlson. If he cannot get his hands on it, then you can actually make progress in Congress even right now. Um, and a lot of the sort of fantasies of the progressive left are just that, fantasies. If you win 60 votes in the Senate and you have the support of the American people for a lot of these issues, then you can do it. But what one finds as one drills down on a lot of these issues is the Democrats simply don't have those, that, those levels of support. Um, and so, for example, when it comes to, let's say, single payer in healthcare, sounds good. You can actually get majorities of Americans saying that they like that. But then when you add the kicker, oh, and this means that there's no more private health insurance, then suddenly you lose those majorities. So until such a time as one part or the other can convince a super majority of the American people that their positions are correct, we're going to be stuck in this sort of trench warfare where the only way to get things done are quiet negotiations behind the scenes with the remaining reasonable members of both parties. And I'm here to tell you, since I actually do that, that it still happens. Thank Jeff, you. Uh, we're um, two minutes away, so we'll take the last question, which Judy Berman put in the chat, which is, what if Democrats all registered as Republicans and vote in the primaries? <laughs> You know, if that were to happen, I think the result would be um, that Republicans would not take extreme positions. They would have to moderate a lot of their positions because they would be answerable. They would be turned out of office. As it is right now, they only answer to the most extreme members of their party. Now, there's actually some reason to believe that some, uh, let's say, democratic reforms like um, first five or ranked choice voting might actually incline Republicans toward that position without Democrats registering en masse uh, to vote in primaries. And Lisa Murkowski in Alaska takes those positions partly because uh, Alaska has that kind of system. And you've sort of seen that elsewhere as well. Um, and I think that actually works in both parties in terms of forcing the candidates to play to the middle. Um, but you know, I would rejoice if uh, a lot of Democrats registered in the Republican primaries, I think it could have a big impact, but that's not the sort of thing I'm holding out hope for because again, people's identities are too much caught up in their partisan affiliations at this point. Well, thank you, uh, Jeff, for a really informative, interesting, lively hour. And to everyone, uh, do join us in June on June 6th when we will have Carol Gradzins talking about how to be a social entrepreneur in three easy steps. So. Join me in thanking Jeff and good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good to meet you. Hope I uh, meet you in person walking down D Street or even uh, online on Facebook. Thank Appreciate you, your Jeff. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Trudy.